Well, hey, everyone. Welcome to this episode of DOD Contract Academy. And we have an awesome episode for you this week. And it's a little bit different. Normally, we are talking with technology providers specifically. But uh, today, we have um, Matos Builders on. We have uh, the two owners, Mike and Rich. Guys, how are you today? Pretty good. How are you? Good. Thanks for agreeing to come on. This is a topic here. You guys are in a in a niche I get a lot of questions about. So yeah. I want to want to bring the experts on to kind of talk about uh, you know uh, construction, building, different things that you're working on, and you know how you go about your federal contracting. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for having us. Awesome. No, thanks. Thanks for coming on. So. Why don't we start with typically we go and we talked a little bit before this about the flow of the podcast and we have both of you on. So I think, Mike, we're going to start with you. Is that right? We're going to sure. just go, uh, we'd like to know, you know, just I mean, start with, uh, you know, a quick overview of just who you are. You know, where are you from? Where did you go to school? Like, how did you get into uh, the business you're in? Then we can go to Rich and, and then how uh, uh, your company came to be. Sure, sure. So, uh, born and raised in Baltimore. Um, Rich and I are actually high school friends. So that's that's how we know each other. Awesome. Um, <clears throat> so, I was in the uh, Army Reserves. I joined in about 2002, and uh, I was in for about 10 years. And when I'd gotten out of the, I did one deployment, I got out of the Army Reserves, and I had a girlfriend. I was looking to get married and just trying to find a job in the middle of a recession. Um, yeah. So Rich and I um, were just hanging out, talking one day and decided, you know, why not start a construction company? <laughs> and, uh, the, the ultimate goal was always to become a federal contractor. Okay. Uh, but we started out mostly <clears throat> doing institutional work, doing a little, little bit of work for the University of Maryland, Johns Hopkins, some nonprofits in the area. Gotcha. Um, and we worked a little bit for some of the bigger GCs doing some some contract work. Uh, but then the, the goal, like I said, was always to become a federal prime. And, you know, a few years later, we were able to able to get our first prime contract. No, that's awesome. Now, I got a couple of questions for you. So, Mike, what, what did you do in the Army Reserve? What was your specialty there? Uh, I was a personnel specialist. OK, interesting. And so a personnel specialist in an MP unit. Um, and then so we I did a a. Um, a training in Haiti uh, where we worked closely with the CBs. We were force protection, but mm -hmm. uh, I ended up helping out with uh, some of the construction on some of the, the homes we were building down there. Okay. And so was construction, was that something you learned while you were in the army or is that something that you kind of grew up doing? How did that skill set? No. It's, so so I, I, I did landscaping a lot growing up, but uh, most of my construction experience came from on the job training, working, working with Matos and working with Rich. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. Well, maybe that's a good place to transition then over to Rich. Yeah. So um, I also, you know, born and raised in Baltimore. Um, and yeah, no, I had a little bit more construction experience. I, I grew up summer jobs, um, working on construction sites, kind of started out as a laborer when I was like 14 and then kind of okay. took different trades over the years. Um, and then eventually, you know, post-college went to work for a developer and was was more project management at that point. Um, and so that, then that kind of pool of work slowed down in, in the, you know, 2008, 2009, um, recession time. And so, yeah, Mike and I, we were 25 when we started Matto. So it was kind of a, uh, an ambitious endeavor from, from the get go, but, um, you know, we got it up and running and, and like Mike said, we, the, the intention was to really target kind of the the customers that, that don't have the same swings in, in spending as, you know, some of the private sector people do. Um, and so we, we really started out with some, like you said, some nonprofits and, you know, um, the local hospitals and mm -hmm. laboratories, um, which is kind of became a niche of ours prior to getting into the federal space, did a lot with Hopkins, Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory, University of Maryland, University of Maryland Biopark, Sure. Um, and stuff at, at various places like that. What kind of what kind of jobs are you doing? So now or then? Then when you started, um, we were doing a lot of subcontracting work back then um, mm -hmm. for the larger, you know, the the mega GCs like your, you know, Lawrence Turner's, Whiting Turner, Hensel Phelps, those kind of guys, and mm -hmm. um, we were doing laboratory case work and some uh, 
drywall and, and finish his work. And then we were we were the prime for um, a number of schools. Um, like we did a, a bunch of work for smaller tenants, tenant fit outs at the University of Maryland Biopark. So like, you know, these three to 5,000 square foot laboratory spaces. Um, and were you know, you build, for, uh, sorry, yeah, I, was just, I was just questioning. So do you, did, were you building the actual structures? Were you renovating or you renovations? Building? Okay. Renovation. So, so the, and even today, the majority of our work is renovation work. Okay. Uh, now we were a subcontractor for some of those buildings that were coming out of the ground that mm -hmm. when, when I said we were working for the mega builders, a lot, a lot of those are brand new buildings. So like the Clark Hall bioengineering building down at college park, Maryland, Okay. Um, yeah, we, we were working on that, but that, that came up out of the ground. We, we still, still do a little bit of sub work, but it's mostly prime now and okay. mostly right. Well, yeah, no, it's a, it's a good way to, uh, to get your feet wet too. really almost regardless of industry when we're talking about some of the government, uh, subcontracting and even for some of the big primes, subcontracting is still part of their, um, part of their income flow. Uh, so you mentioned, uh, Mike, that you that federal contracting was always the goal with uh, the company. So why was that? Did you did you pick that up in the army, or what was the thought process there? Well, just the area in which we are. That's there's a lot of uh, federal buildings. You know, being close to DC, yeah. a lot of federal agencies, and it just, it seemed like it would be you know a, a good market for us to get into, really, just because of the proximity. Okay. Interesting. So you guys both knew each other in high school. You spent some time in the army. It sounds like Rich had uh, more of a more of a background in construction and whatnot, but you guys decided to come together and form this business, starting with the, some labs and nonprofits and schools. But eventually you make your way in, onto federal contracts as primes. Now, how did that transition take place? What, can you Can you recall... And really what I'm looking for here is a lot of companies are wondering, you know, the small businesses that listen, what's their first inroad going to be onto a federal contract? Is it going to be as a sub? Is it going to be as a prime? And, and really, you know, how can they go about recreating maybe some of the stuff that, that you guys have done? Um, so, yeah, curious to hear about some of your early wins. So, well, technically, our first win uh, was a was kind of before we had really started targeting the federal government, we wound up with a um, a random guy who reached out to us in West Virginia at a VA to install a, what's called a cyclorama wall. It's like a green screen. Okay. They, they would film themselves in front of. And, um, but then, then later down the road, we were really trying to build past performance um, in, you know, similar facilities. And we did, we, we started off doing some subcontracting for, the um, some some native corporations um, on some of the local military bases here, and we really thought that that was going to be like a great inroad. And um, and then that was you know a couple years into being in business, we applied for the 8A program and we were accepted. And we kind of thought we were just going to hit the ground running, like we were pumped. Yeah. And the the sale that's when we really got you know, the taste for the federal sales cycle. And uh, it was about a year and a half, I think, before we got our first award. And that was actually um, through another, through Guy Clark, right? Yeah. Somebody yeah. somebody introduced us to a contracting team down at, um, at Army Research Laboratories. And they were like, okay. hey, these guys specialize in lab space because we were doing a lot of that up here in Baltimore. And then, mm -hmm. We kind of just started talking to them and they gave us an IDIQ and just started firing off task orders. And, you know, we were we were doing a great job on those and just kind of use that to market to other agencies. And then it kind of snowballed. We got Once we got that first job, that really um, validated us in the eyes sure. of other contracting officers. You know, once we got that one guy to take a chance on us, everybody else was a little bit more willing. Yeah, yeah, there were definitely some 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 dark days prior to that where we were really like, you know, thought we were gonna really we we thought we were gonna have trouble handling the amount of work we were gonna win, and then just kind of sat there and and then um, but no, doing doing great now. But you know, looking back, it's kind of funny. Yeah, 
Yeah, it's it's interesting because what you're what you're talking about really speaks to I think what a lot of companies once they realize how the process works, um, and and luckily you guys did some some never really figure it out right, but a lot of companies will go get those certifications and then expect the work to come rolling in and it doesn't. Um, but you know the other is is past performance and how important that is and and what it can do for you as you're kind of making your way through. Was that first contract an eight A contract that IDIQ? It- it was, yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. And um, but we had really we expected a lot of our private sector past performance to to resonate a little more than it did. And you know, we mm-hmm. would we turn it in and they'd be like, Well, it's not federal, you don't have a CPAR, and it's kind of chicken and the egg. How do you get a CPAR until you have yeah. a contract? Until you get a contract without a CPAR. And um, and that was that was kind of how we did it. We went down and we were invited to do a um an in-person pitch and uh and a couple months, a couple of weeks, a couple of months later, we mm-hmm. we were given the award, which was a really exciting day. Oh, that's great! And it, it, something else that speaks to is how important relationships are in yeah. general contracting. You know, because um, because there is, I would say, probably when you take the the businesses that that fail at uh, trying to sell to the government, a lot of them what they're doing is just looking for RFPs and RFQs and writing proposals and sending them in. And and they're not winning, right? It's it's it really is a relationship game, and in your past performance and your relationships, and you know finding out about opportunities ahead of time, getting those introductions really important. Well, and we also did not realize the importance of the proposal writing itself either. We were writing our proposals, and now we we have you know a proposal writer. But prior to that, it was you know they were they were a little lackluster, which I don't think uh, helped you. But yeah, sure. all of the above, and then the the relationship game was um, that's something we've kind of been we were late to the game on that one too. We didn't realize how important that was. You know, when you're new to it, you think the government's the government; it's all standardized, right? And that's not the case. No, definitely, definitely not. And you have it doesn't help when you have, especially with the military, you have the program managers and contracting officers changing out every couple of years. And you know, if they're not a government civilian, you got to kind of recreate those relationships and uh, stay on top of that. So no, there's definitely a lot of moving parts there. Um, and I could see you're also, well, at least it says in, in the system I'm using that you're a uh, hub zone and, and veteran owned. So have, yes. any, have any of the other certifications uh, helped you out along the way? Uh, yeah, the, the, the hub, zone, hub zone has. Um, so we were recently just awarded a uh, Hub Zone of the Year by the Hub Zone Council, Hub Zone Business of the Year by the Hub Zone Council and the ADA Association. Oh, congratulations. Uh, New Orleans, uh, about two weeks ago. Thank you. Done in New Orleans about two weeks ago for that. Awesome. Uh, but yeah, the Hub Zone, the Hub Zone has helped us out as well. Um, you know. Sure. And yeah, you know, we've we've actually um we've been pretty active over the past couple of years on some lobbying efforts with the Hub Zone program. Um okay. as, I'm sure you know it's the one program that, that nobody. Well, no, I shouldn't say nobody. That most agencies don't meet their goal on, mm-hmm. and it's kind of if you take a step back, as far as like impact on a neighborhood, it's it's the most impactful program. So you can you know your business is located in in a hub zone. You're spending money there, and you need your to employ the people and. Yeah. Um, you know, any of the other business designations, you could hire, you know, all of your employees from Ivy League schools, you know, sure. and not that there aren't Ivy Leaguers and hub zones, but it's just you have to you have to target these underprivileged areas and and help bring them up. So we, you know, are, are firm believers that they should uh, remove the rule of two for the hub zone sole source and open that up try and get people to meet their goals. And this was actually something we had met with um, the late uh, Congressman Elijah Cummings on a number of times, and he was a big supporter of it. And he was kind of working with us uh, as well as we had some support from the ABLE Foundation here in Baltimore because they're, they're big fans of that program as well on trying to push advocacy for that program and, and how do we fix it? How do we make it work? You know, how do we how do we make it easier for the agencies to meet those goals? And so that's where we actually, um, well, when he passed away, we got turned on to um, Senator Ben Cardin's uh, Small Business Committee, and they introduced us to the Hub Zone Council, which is where we met. I don't know if you know Michelle, who runs that, but um, they were they were great. And then they introduced us to the National Aid Association, and those two 
associations have been, you know, just the relationships and the wealth of knowledge and the courses and everything about it have just been tremendously um, helpful for us. So, but that's still a mission of ours is to try and get that, get something. I, I think that's the easiest thing to do is just to remove the rule too and let let people sole source the hub zones and, and you know, it's help, help bring these areas back up. Yeah, I mean, that would be, that would be incredible if if you could do that. Can you explain, because everyone listening, they may not be familiar. In fact, I probably argue most aren't familiar with the rule of two. If you could okay. talk just a little bit about what that is so everyone knows. Sure. So um, when a when a federal um, agency has a requirement and they're thinking of setting it aside for small business, they need to send out um, a notification seeking industry feedback uh, to determine whether or not there are two or more capable firms that could compete on the opportunity. So it's really, well, so so then if there is only one that responds, then they are allowed to sole source it to that one person. If there's more than one that responds, they are supposed to compete it. So the amount of effort it takes them to go and advertise the project and get this feedback is similar to that of just sending it out, you know, as a competition. And mm -hmm. so it kind of takes away from their ease of sole sourcing something, even though the language in the FAR is written that they can sole source to any small business. It just makes it more difficult where the 8A program does not have that language. So they can just choose you if they you know, think that you're, you know, capable of, of performing on the project. Sure. And, you know, something that our listeners are, you know, they hear me kind of getting on my soapbox on all the time is that pre-solicitation phase, the market research phase, which is really what you're, what you're talking about, um, where they'll send out the sources sought and the request for information and to see, hey, you know, because I can't, like you said, you know, if I'm putting my government hat on, we can't set this aside for a woman-owned small business or a hub zone if there aren't two of those businesses out there that could do the work, right? So that's that's one of the things that you're uh, trying to prove. One of the things that I, you know, I push my clients and our students in the academy and the people listening to the podcast to do is finding those opportunities ahead of time. And whether or not the government's asking for hub zone or woman woman owned, if if you happen to be that or have that specialization, you can recommend that the government set that aside, right? And, and often companies will find somebody else that can do the work just to show them that there are two hub zones or woman-owned small businesses or SDV OSBs. Do you guys ever, are you ever taking that tax to win contracts or, or, and if not, what is your kind of methodology for finding work in the government? So we monitor forecasts. Uh, we respond to sources sought. Um, and then we try to find projects that are a good fit for us in terms of size, scope, location, and well as well as uh, award method. So mm -hmm. um, we find that we have a pretty strong technical um, response. A lot of our past performance is, pre is, is, is pretty good, pretty um, specific. Um, so we try to find projects that are a good fit, and we rely heavily heavily on our technical to be able to separate ourselves from the pack. Okay. And you find They're your more of a best value than like a low price, technically acceptable. Well, and because you have a niche, and this is something else that I we talk about a lot is you know you're focused and you're able to do that if you do have a niche that's specialized, right? And um, I can remember you know companies coming into my government office with a capability statement that said they could do everything, right? There's 50 different things on there. But you know, as a business, if you do your homework, what the government's hiring for. So if the government's hiring for, you know, laboratory, and that's the kind of work you're going after, laboratory renovation, building, you know, whatever the, you know, other parameters are there, you know, they want to hire somebody that specializes in that, not, you know, a construction company that, you know, lists a hundred different things that, that they could do. Is that, would you say that's accurate for construction and what you guys are doing? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and, and especially when you get into the specialized construction, it's like our employees know it, our subcon we know who the subcontractors are, they know it, you know, it's like you get into this, like you're saying, this niche world where you kind of know who everybody is and it's right. established and it's, it's not, you're, you're, you know, you get the job and you're trying to figure it out. Like we kind of, 
grew up in labs and we we're still living labs. And, and now a lot of our business as a result of that is repeat, which is great. Um, you know, we've established ourselves with customers. They like us. Yeah. They know what they're getting when they go to us, but that, that took some time. So. Do you guys work nationally or just uh, in the local area or. Regionally. Regionally. Um, the majority of our work is, if you're familiar with uh, the Maryland area, is Aberdeen Proving Ground, mm -hmm. Washington, D.C., and Frederick, Maryland, Fort Detrick out there. However, um, we've done work in West Virginia, Northern Virginia, Delaware, Pennsylvania. Um, mm -hmm. We're looking at some work with an existing client in uh, North Carolina. Um, so most of it is in that mid-Atlantic region, uh, but we have the ability to, to go further. So I have a question. This is a question some uh, you know people that listen to the show will will send in every now and then, which is, so you're licensed, a construction company is licensed in one state, but you're working on federal property probably most of the time, I would imagine. So do you need to hire people with uh, specific licenses in the state you're in, or is that because you're on federal property, you can work anywhere? How does that work? Uh, that's, well, typically, no, the, the federal government is typically its own um permitting agency mm -hmm. but you there are rfps where it specifies um that you need to be licensed in that state you as the prime need to be licensed in that state sometimes they'll say you can use a key subcontract that's licensed in, in that state um mm -hmm. it's really solicitation by solicitation but the the vast majority are um it's just if, if they want you they can use you Okay. No, that's awesome. And I think that that touches on questions that we get a lot um, as far as construction is concerned or any licensed trade, essentially. Now, I'm, I'm looking at your growth, basically, over the years. And it, and it looks like you guys are doing really well with your federal sales. Have you noticed any fluctuations or any sticking points that you're trying to get past? Or or, or is there some you know great opportunity that kind of came your way as you were making your way through the process and getting more past performance? Yeah, so our we had some pretty good growth uh, back in like 17, 18, and 19. And then when COVID hit, mm. uh, we had kind of a flat year. Um, and it's starting to pick, starting to pick up again. But um, I think just with the the lockdowns and people working from home, um, I just, things just seem to slow down. Um, but it's like I said, it's it's starting to pick up again. And we're we're starting to see more sources sought, uh, more pre-solicitation notices. So things are things are definitely picking up, but it was slow for a couple of years. Yeah, I, I can imagine. I do have a question for you. Just speaking about federal contracting in general, small businesses over the past 10 years, there's been a decline in the amount of small businesses selling to the US federal government. Um, in fact, I want to say 2021 is the last time I, I crunched all the numbers. 2022, so I could probably do soon, but you know how the reporting comes in. But in 21, it was less than half of 1% of small businesses were selling to the US government, the federal government. And that had has been declining over the past decade. Why do you why do you think that is? From your perspective, uh, I mean, I can't speak for everybody, but I think it has to do with the barriers to entry. I mean, I we speak to uh, friends who are in the private sector, you know, very successful in the private sector, and they're you know, oh, we want to, I, I want to get into federal, I want to get into federal, I want to get into federal, and. You know, we kind of have to level set with them sometimes be like, well, if you if you do, I think you should take, you know, you should look at a five year plan. Right. How are you going to, you know, figure out who's buying what you sell, figure out how they buy it, figure out how to market to them, figure out, um, you know, their process. And then and then federal versus private can be wildly different. Um, yeah. I mean, you you're working for you know, a private owner. And, and a lot of times they just want their building open and they're like, get it done, get it done as fast as I can. So I can start collecting rent. Right. And, you know, the federal government, there's a process and sometimes it can be annoying, you know, for like a go, go, go situation. If you're hung up on, you know, some, some red tape on a project and it can be one little, one little approval um, for one piece of the project. that's kind of got the whole thing hanging up. And that can be difficult for people. So, you know, I, I I don't know why it's decreased, but maybe it's just they find it easier to to do things in the more fast-paced environment. I don't I don't know. 
Mm. Yeah, I think, um, you know, when I think through it, and by the way, my wife would say you're speaking my love language when you start talking about uh, researching who buys what you sell, how they make the purchases, you know, where they're making the purchases, the contract vehicles. It's a good thing to touch on because, and and again, all all public sector sales information is public. And that's not something that people normally think about. And what that means is you don't have to try to invent the way that you're going to sell to the government. You can go and look at the data and it's it's right there for you as long as you're willing to kind of deconstruct how maybe whether it's your competitors are doing or looking at the agencies buying what you sell, you can come up with a step-by-step process, but it, it takes time. And uh, federal sales is the long game. So I personally think that it's probably a a mixture of maybe not knowing about the opportunity, not knowing how to do it. And, and I'm curious could, about how long did it take you guys to figure out what a good process was that worked where you could generate that recurring revenue with the government? We're still figuring it out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's you- uh, it's a nonstop, uh, nonstop, uh, process you're always learning mm-hmm. but it was really it probably like th- i'd say a good three years mm-hmm. probably good it, three years to really kind of start to to figure it out and then and then yeah it's constantly being refined and then it, yeah. it really kind of started working for itself you know it's like five years in i i often say it's like you you know you're out you plant all these seeds and then they're gonna like go through like, you know, a germination phase. And that's like a, you know, a year where you've just kind of introduced yourself to a federal customer and, and then they've got to kind of mull it over and, you know, all they have is your capability statement or something. And then you got to keep, you know, you got to keep, keep in front of them. And then all of a sudden it's like, you know, they kind of start to know who you are and then an opportunity comes up, you respond to it, you know, just kind of, and then, and then you got to wait for the award and then the award comes and then you actually have to do the work and then mm-hmm. you know the money comes. And so it's this just incredibly long cycle. But then once the wheel kind of starts going around, you know, it, it repeats and repeats. Right. And it, the concept is you just keep getting bigger and the opportunities get, you know, better and, you know, everything just improves. And so, well, I mean, we're definitely in it, um, but it took, I'd say, yeah, three at least three years to get the wheel spinning. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it sounds, it sounds very similar to whether technology, software, cybersecurity companies, law firms, account, it's it's very similar. And of course the federal acquisitions regulations, it regulate all industries within the uh, federal buying structure, but there are differences in between some of the different, like for instance, office supplies get sold in a different way than construction services. Right. Um, you mentioned something that I thought was interesting, and maybe we could um, pick on you. You hired a proposal writer like to work for you guys, and I think that hits on because you know the critiques uh, that I hear, and that I'm sure you've heard from companies that are putting proposals in and they don't win. Right? You hear, "Hey, it looks like the solicitation was written for my competitor." You hear, uh, "Government contracting's rigged." You hear, you know, you hear a lot of things like that, and. What I tell people is the solicitation might have been written for your competitor, but it's not rigged. And, you know, what I mean by that is, you know, you might have a business during that market research phase that's working with a program office to develop the requirements and the different specifications that are going to go into a contract, right? Because, you know, the program manager probably isn't a construction expert. Right. The program manager probably has, you know, a hundred different things he's doing. And so that's why we would reach out to companies that, you know, were had whether it was cutting edge technology or they were the subject matter experts to help develop that solicitation, like what's going to be in it. And we talked to a lot of different people for that. But now I usually knew what company I wanted to hire when a solicitation went out, and, and probably most do. But I and the government, we we you don't always get to hire who you want, right? So, and, and I think that speaks to when you were talking about the proposals because those proposals come in and this is where, you know, all the FAR and fairness and competition is really going to come to play because each part of a proposal gets critiqued and scored. And sometimes there's teams of people looking at these things, often not the people that you've been talking to. So it's so critically important to write that proposal correctly 
because you can win. You, could, you technically could win any solicitation. So if, if you write a great proposal and and you've done your homework, it, it really could lock it in for you. But you know, how did you come to the? Did, were you losing proposals? Were you what kind of pushed you in the direction of hey, maybe professional support for the proposal writing, or or maybe more emphasis and in, in you know focus on that piece of it. Um, yeah, we not winning and, uh, we were getting all the debriefs and it, it just became apparent that, um, proposal writing was way more of a science than we had, you know, than we had given it credit for. And, um, it's a, it's a skill. I mean, it's a, it's a real skill and, you know, we're, we're builders, um, we're great at getting the jobs done and right. not necessarily bad proposal writers, but they're definitely better proposal writers. Yeah. yeah. To kind of piggyback off that as a business owner, you can't be the best at everything. Right. And then part of the, uh, part of being successful is finding people that are better than you at certain things and hiring them and putting them in place to, to let them execute. Sure. Yeah. Amen. Absolutely. And one of the things I do see with proposals is hiring companies that hire somebody that understands the structure and can do compliance matrices and that type of work, um, reviewing them, making sure they're hitting the nuance of the fire and understand everything. That is extremely beneficial. But typically, companies still do, because at the core of it, the subject matter expert Tease needs to be input into the proposal. So I guess just for our listeners, one one mistake I see some businesses make is if they offload, if they try to offload the whole thing to a professional proposal writer, but that doesn't understand maybe the technology or the solution or the construction project, that could be a recipe for disaster. But a recipe for success I've seen is where you have somebody like that, whether they work for you or you're outsourcing it, and you're working with them. So you kind of ensure what you know is in there and is correct. And then they can take that and put it in the right format. Do you think that is kind of what you guys are doing or, or do you think yeah, I'm absolutely. Or... Yep. And then we have, um, so, you know, we've kind of built a whole team. We have 50 mm -hmm. people here now. Yeah. And so our, the, the project management team will chime in on, um, you know, like the, like what you're talking about, like the, for us, it's like a constructability plan or a work yeah. plan, you know, that kind of stuff. And then a lot of the, like you're saying, the compliance matrices and all that kind of stuff he, he does, but um, it's a back and forth for sure. Right. Between, yeah. the, between the experts. Yeah. And then the real work starts when you're on contract. Right. <laughs> which, which often gets, which often gets forgotten about, you know, with the new businesses, they're trying to get the contract, trying to get the contract, then they win finally. And, you know, oh crap, there's this whole other, whole other piece to it. Um, <laughs> no, that's great. And you guys have had a lot of success. What, what, what are your goals here going forward? Where do you guys see uh, the construction business going? And, are, are, and I didn't ask, are you guys also doing commercial work or is it only federal? Well, we're still doing commercial work. The majority of it is federal prime, um, mm -hmm. but we have some, you know, relationships in the commercial world that we have developed, and uh, we we keep those. And we also need the um, outside A A business as well, so that helps with that. Okay. Yeah, and then going forward, I think it's um, you know just to keep doing what we're doing, um, keep growing the way we're growing. Um, you know, we we really enjoy. Um, like just, you know, laboratory, but other complicated projects for yeah. our clients. Um, we, you know, we like to think of ourselves as, you know, we have a, a small business culture, but, you know, large business product. So, you know, there are projects out there that, you know, like they're complicated in nature, they're difficult. The, the buyers are, you know, they kind of want to give it to like a Parsons or somebody, you know, huge because they just know that it'll get done. But then, they may not want to deal with, you know, the the stuff that comes along with a large business and they want to deal with, you know, an owner like us. And so we kind of right. feel like it's our, our niche. We can provide that same level of effort, but you get the kind of small business feel and keep that, keep that going and, uh, and just keep, you know, repeat business with, with who we have. And, and, you know, maybe like Mike said, considering an expansion down in North Carolina and, you know, I don't know that we're, you know, looking to expand regionally as much as we are within the, you know, organizations 
around here uh, and who we're already with and just doing more for them, solving more problems for them. Okay. Have you, do you guys do any skiff work? We do. Um, as soon as you said complicated construction projects, I mean, that, that one's a little bit closer to my, uh, my background. So I was uh, curious because I know that one can be a, a painful process. Yep. And now yeah, we're familiar with it. And that's right in line with the, you know, what we're talking about complicated projects. Sure. Um, yeah. That's a, it's that's good. a specialty. I mean, that is a, it really speaks to how important it is to specialize in something and to, to master it. And any, any company that understands that and, and does good work will be great. I mean, some of the things you were talking to are, are the reason this podcast exists, right? So I always wanted to be able to bring in small businesses when I could even on bigger projects, because not that I have anything against the big defense companies, but a big, de- because there are places for them, right? When we're building aircraft, that's who you want. But, you know, when you're doing a lot of working with a big defense contractor is almost like working with another government, right? And, or or a big government contractor. It's, it's the same thing. So you get a lot of bureaucracy and you don't get that ownership, um, small business vibe like you were talking about. And I know I always found that the small business owners were motivated. They wanted to do good work. They wanted to support the troops. They and they wanted to, you know, they're building their business. They were motivated, and their response times were typically better. And so there's there's a lot of benefit to that. And I I can see that's why you guys are growing and, and will continue to grow. Thank you. Well, guys, thank you for coming on the podcast today. This again, this is a niche we haven't explored, and I wanted to I wanted to put you in front of the audience. If you could, I ask this to of every uh, every person I interview on the show, basically every business. You know, if you had some advice to give to the small business owner that's just getting started, what would that look like? I would, I'd say, yeah, leverage the associations. Don't be afraid to outsource. Um, and and be very careful about what you sign up for right off the bat, because um, once you own it, it's yours. <laughs> the whole everything that's in there, and um, and just just stay focused and don't be afraid to start small. Um, there's nothing wrong with it. You know, you don't need to to grow a business. You know, like overnight, it can take time, and uh, oftentimes that that proves to be the better path, and that's kind of the path we took, and it's worked very well. Great. Well, well said. Guys, thanks again for coming on. If somebody wants to reach out to you, where, where's the best place to find you? Uh, so you can go to our website, uh, www.mattosbuilders.com. And uh, we're on LinkedIn as well. So you can you can follow us on there. We put out a little bit of uh, content every week. All right. Great. Well, thank you for what we're doing. Well, I will put all of that information in the show notes for all the listeners. Thanks again, guys. Thanks, everyone, for listening this week to the DoD Contract Academy podcast. It's been a great episode. Check the show notes. Check them out at the website. Check them out on LinkedIn. And you can reach out to us at dodcontract.com if you have questions about government contracting or want to learn more. Thanks again, and we'll see you next week.